All right. Welcome to the Sumer Sports Show. We're here to review week 10 of the NFL season. We're more than halfway. We can definitively say that now. Thomas, uh, how are you doing today? I just, I'm blown away by the weekend. I love the excitement. Every time I turn around, uh, there's something that's going awry, right? Um, with the games. And I'm sorry, someone just called through. I don't know how that came onto my, um, um, our podcast. But Nick Polk, by the way, from Athletes First, one of the best out there at his job, is trying to call me. Nick, you probably hear me, but I'm on a podcast with Eric Giger, so it'll have to be another time. Thank you. Well, I'm glad that uh, – yeah, I mean, that's a high honor given, you know, Nick was your salary cap guy for all those years in Atlanta and uh, obviously has probably something insightful to say to you. Um, and uh, – and and we'll, we'll have to wait. We'll have to wait a few a few minutes as we review Week Ten. I honestly think here's Thomas. I know that um, you know inside the chat uh, you don't have necessarily the the power to put this up here, but I do think that this is interesting. Wingham five thirteen five thirteen. I think is in reference to my old uh, stomping grounds of Cincinnati. Uh, sports hurt my soul sometimes. Is Harbaugh an issue? It is funny, and I let, let's skip up because I know you know this is a team near and dear to your heart, the Cleveland Browns, one of the teams you, you used to work for and a team you grew up rooting for, and the Baltimore Ravens, who were once the Cleveland Browns, and then you know obviously and obviously now uh, are their own franchise. Um, you know John Harbaugh, Super Bowl winning coach. Yesterday, so through ten games, the Baltimore Ravens have trailed for the third fewest minutes in the history of the NFL. The other th four teams in the top five through 10 weeks were all 10-0. and 0. This, this Baltimore team, Thomas, is 7-3 and three after a, a crushing defeat yesterday at the hands of Cleveland at home, which again is another one. I remember texting you about this. I think it was week five when they were up like 10-3 to the Pittsburgh Steelers. I remember messaging. I go, they F around and lose this game four times a year. Well, now we're at three games. And, and it's they, they had the Colts game, which was at home, and Gardner Minshew, back at quarterback, goes ahead and beats him. This team gets beat yesterday. And I worry, Thomas, because I we talked about on the on the Wednesday pod how many truly elite people that organization has in it, you know, from Harbaugh to Eric DaCosta, all the way down to the analytics people, to the cap people, to assistant coaches. They are – they're a great franchise in the NFL. And yet, Thomas, when we think about who's representing the AFC in the Super Bowl every year, it's Kansas City. It's Cincinnati in their own division, a team that I think many yeah. people would, would say is inferior to Baltimore in many ways, makes the Super Bowl. Um, obviously, New England, et cetera, et cetera. We have not seen a Baltimore team in the conference championship since 2012, the last time they were in the Super Bowl. And, you know, they haven't, seen, they haven't been in a Super Bowl since then. Is there a concern with Baltimore that they're kind of one of those always like a day late and a dollar short teams when it comes to truly taking that next step and being an elite team in the AFC? I don't I don't personally believe so. I know what you're saying, and, and it's tough for some people to argue against it, but I would say this. We had a conversation a little bit earlier. I know you said you didn't want to go in this direction. John Harbaugh is one of the coaches out there that I – categorically would consider trading a first round pick for some people may argue that at certain levels, not for any other reason, because it's a big decision to make, right? When you're talking about trading talent, this league, I, the more I'm in it, the more I realize you have to fit everyone in the right places, but he is a hell of a coach and he has a really good understanding of leading. You also have a GM and Eric DaCosta. You have a, a, a data team. It is so well-rounded in so many ways. Why they come up short, it's tough to say. I mean, I, I want to throw it back to you a little bit because statistically, is there something that stands out in all of our analytics that would suggest why that is? Because I would be very interested to know. Yeah. So we're going to sumersports.com. I'm going to, I'm going to actually pitch an article that I wrote this weekend because it actually has John Harbaugh as the, the cover guy. But I went through and actually built, Thomas, what's called a mix effect model, which basically I was trying to determine how valuable a coach is to the point spread um, during the course 
uh, after adjusting for, you know, the team strength and quarterback strength and all that stuff. And going back to 1999, which is as far back as we have the market data and the coaching data game to game, John Harbaugh is second in the NFL, um, worth about 1.37 points to the point spread, which it's interesting because I've shown you this work and you've always been like, that seems low. And I've shown other people work and they're like, that seems high. You know, uh, well, Goldilocks this, right? But like, Harbaugh has meant more to the point spread since the millennium, the beginning of the millennium than all but just Bill Belichick, who I think we've all agree is the best coach of all time. When you look at this list, there's not that much you can really scoff at. I mean, Brian Billick won a Super Bowl with Trent Dilfer as his quarterback, Bruce Arians, uh, obviously won a Super Bowl as well, resurrected the career of Carson Palmer. Doug Peterson won a Super Bowl. Bill Cowher won a Super Bowl. Dick Vermeil won a Super Bowl with the Rams, Thomas. The NFL record yeah. for the unlikeliest Super Bowl, that 1999 Rams team with Kurt Warner was 150 to 1 to win the Super Bowl uh, mm -hmm. when the season started. And, you know, we always we only talk positively, but here are the active active guys. And again, Harbaugh, um, when you look at it per game, is means about as much to his team as anybody. So I agree with you. And I think when you think about a list of like guys who you would trade for, the pretty you know, I think yep. age you have to factor in with some of these guys. Harbaugh's still young. Um, that that would, would matter to me, but I absolutely agree with you. Um, as far as looking at what could be going wrong with the Ravens, sumersports.com backslash players backslash quarterbacks. I always start to look at where the quarterback position is. And I find it interesting, Thomas, that Lamar Jackson, of all people, when you look at ex total expected points, um, you know, the one thing that's really interesting is that when you look at his rushing expected points, he's only added a little under a touchdown running the football. And when you look at the rushing yards by quarterbacks, he's obviously tops, but he's not going to rush for 1,200 yards the way that he has historically. And I think that that's a big deal. I think that the fact is, is the quarterback play, I think, has been better than, than in the past for Jackson. But there are games like yesterday where – they need to buy a basket in the second half of the game, and he he simply can't do it. And that doesn't mean I don't think he's very good. What it means is that I think that they are simply him stepping up and playing better football away from away from you know sort of achieving their goals. I, I concur. Where are we going with this now, though? Like, I want to make sure I'm staying online for you. Well, because... I, yeah, I, I mean, let's just keep talking about that game. Like, a big win for Stefanski, right? Big win for Kevin Stefanski and his Browns team. Um, Deshaun Watson is in a is in a walking boot, from what I can tell. Um, if they host Pittsburgh this week as three-and-a-half-point favorites. So, again, it's sort of classic Brown stuff where you sort of feel like you're getting over the hump. You're six and three. Uh, people should be positive about you, but now the quarterback, the high price guy who has played pretty good football the last two weeks, let's be honest about it, hasn't played that well down the stretch. Um, now he's banged up, right? And so I, I think when I look at this game, I think I, I just think the AFC is a lot flatter than we want it to believe want to believe it, right? The 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 Ravens are a little are are not this this juggernaut that we thought that they were. The Browns are nipping at their heels. And then yesterday, and I want to talk briefly because um, we had this on our sheet, and let's transition to this game. Cincinnati was taken down by Houston yesterday at home. A quarterback in C.J. Stroud who I, I think should be getting MVP votes at this point, given how much he's resurrected that team. And we look back, and, and again, let, let's talk about this for a brief second. Talk about coaching. Three head coach, four head coaches, if you count uh, the last year of Bill O'Brien. Four head coaches in four years for Houston. Nick Casario finally finds the right guy in D'Amico Ryans, it appears. That that game had a little bit of everything, Thomas, from the from the Stroud performance to the Bengals kind of melting down to, you know, what this means now in the AFC, where Houston is currently hanging on to the seventh seed and would be in the playoffs if the season ended today. So, D'Amico, it's good to see that going on. It's good to see that he and Nick Casario are working well. You know me, and I've said this to you on air and off air. I'm never one that wants to jump in right away and, and laud everyone like they have the answer. And, and D'Amico is the answer right away. It's, it's, it's very young in the game, right? They're four and four now, right? Four and five, five, and, four, yeah. five and four, excuse me, five and four. You know, everyone's talking about their our opportunity to get in the playoffs. Who knows why? Good guy. Players really love playing for him because, you know, there's a there. 
it's not necessary categorically like the answer, right? It's early and it's young. What I like more than anything, putting Nick Casario aside and D'Amico Ryans aside, let's talk about the quarterback. I've mentioned this before. Let's talk about Bobby Slowick. Let's talk about how you take a quarterback like this that even one of the hot businesses, S2, and this is going to be interesting. One day we should get them on Sumer Sports to talk to us for 15 minutes. I wonder if they would do that because I like the guys and you can't just j- judge someone off of one deal, but there's a lot of people that are throwing darts, right? At them well, saying, and, and I don't know if the darts are necessarily fair. A couple people I talked to in the league now, again, you know, cognition tests are tough. Sure. Um, knowing people who work in that field professionally, the signal you're going to get is weak. The signal you're going to get, you, you, you sent me this, this message from Peter King, who, you know, I respect greatly a legend of the game. He talks about the, you know, we're terrible at evaluating quarterback play, right? Like we, I think we do a good job of elimination, right? But we don't do, we have, we, we don't have that many sins of omission. There aren't guys who are like Dak Prescott, who are fourth round picks that come in and are good starters. But the sins of commission that we have at the position are huge, right? Trading 200 million in assets to, to basically flip a coin between Young and Stroud is 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 a that's a that's a that can be a franchise crushing move at a move at times and yet in some cases when it's Patrick Mahomes or when it's Deshaun Watson or when it's it can be a great move and so like we're just and and so I'm gonna be like look there are jokes you can make right you know oh Houston won by S two today and all this kind of, like there are tons of jokes you can make but the fact of the matter is is there are a lot of reasons he could have he could have done poorly on this test not the least of which could have been he might not have even tried on it, right? We, If you're the favorite at the Combine to be the first overall pick, what are your incentives to go out and ace this test, right? Like, we've all gotten, like, it, it like you know, there, there are plenty of things that could be separate from his score on the test that could be a, 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 sig- a signal to us uh, of how intelligent he was. So, yeah, I mean – Look, I mean, this comes back to me. It's it's totally on the team builders, the head coach and the GM to put your quarterback in the right spot so they can be as successful as possible, right? To me, I told you this. In that earlier game in the season when the Texans played the Falcons, I thought they were just slapping it around. To be honest with you, not slap, that's not fair. I thought they – sorry, better way to put that, to be honest – I thought they were playing very conservatively and they were just happy. Remember on and off air, I said, I'm just agitated that they didn't just come pin their ears back and play with some aggressiveness. And I felt they were just trying to play not to get sacked. But remember a lot of us, when you're, when you're putting together a team, you get your new hit, your new uh, quarterback there. Eight games in is right where the situation is, right? Let's kick into gear. And we're watching him kick it into gear, which I think is, you know, is obviously very, very positive. I mean, those are big time numbers the last two games. Now, okay, what was the rankings of their last two opponents on defense? Can you pull that up quickly? Yeah, so we'll look, we'll look, we'll go ahead here and we'll go to let's get back on the let's get back on the saddle here. We should probably just have the stats page up, but we know people listen uh in other places. But if you go to teams here for us here, you go to defense. So, yeah, they played Tampa Bay. Um, so when you look at worst defenses, Tampa Bay, although they had a pretty good effort the other day, uh, yesterday against Tennessee, against the rookie quarterback, Tampa Bay is in the top half of the league in terms yeah. of EPA per play. Um, but, you know, again, you're at home, you're inside. Tampa Bay had some injuries. I know Davis as well as Dean have both been banged up. So, you know, not not quite as good of an effort. But then yesterday – when you're looking at who they're facing in Cincinnati, Cincinnati's had a down year defensively. Um, you know, they're 20th or so. And a lot of that, I know you're a big fan of Jesse Bates. He came over here to Atlanta from Cincinnati. Von Bell is a veteran safety. He's now playing for Carolina. Um, they've had, you know, some in you know, Sam Hubbard, I believe, missed yesterday's game uh, as a pass rusher. But yeah, and, and when, you know, to your point, like, I think I think the tricky part, and this is this goes back to you know sort of the Mac Jones thing. I think we have to be careful um, with distinguishing what is encouraging from a young quarterback versus what is 
truly being good, right? If you like, I think that Baker Mayfield this year has been encouraging. I don't think he's good, Thomas. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm, I'm, I think he's played really well for him. And yet, like, what does that mean? I'm going to back up the truck and pay him a veteran contract um, as a result of this? Probably not. Mac Jones in 2021, Thomas, was encouraging. That doesn't mean he's good, right? Or that doesn't mean he's out of the woods yet. Sam Howell's encouraging this year. It doesn't mean he's good. I think Stroud, you know, when you look at this league and like, look at notice here, Thomas, total EPA. He's sixth in the NFL behind just Jalen Hurts, Zach Prescott, Patrick Mahomes, Brock Purdy, and Josh Allen. Um, you do have to do a little bit of like, okay, how much of this is the offense generating this and how much of it is the quarterback generating this? I think I, I'm interested because one thing to look at that's really interesting, if you look among the top six quarterbacks, Thomas, mm-hmm. J- Stroud has the lowest completion percentage by a lot. Yep. He has the highest average depth of target by a lot. Mm-hmm. Not by a lot, but no. by you know a decent amount. So what that means is this is a home run hitter, right? In baseball, this would be like Greg Vaughn hitting 219 but hitting 35 home runs. Um, eventually, that go, you know, you want, you know, some quarterbacks, I think like Dak Prescott is more like Tony Gwynn, hitting singles through the left side of the infield all the, the entire time. So the question is, is, is this sustainable? I do think that there are markers in his data, Thomas, that make me a little less bullish on whether he can sustain being a downfield low completion percentage guy look i saw some plays i saw some moving around which he can do remember at ohio state they were always saying he should run more and he you know what is his true ability he he has legitimate ability and versatility right i loved him moving around yesterday darting some throws which i thought were really impressive look i like the kid a lot we don't have to get into this but i mean you know what my head is was on the quarterbacks coming into this past draft and we, it'll be interesting to see how they all play out. You know, you could lead into to, to Levis, for instance, right? Everyone was going crazy off of one game against Atlanta. <laughs> and I just, I feel it's unfortunate on both sides, right? I think then you start building up this, all of a sudden you build up these crazy expectations where I it was drilled into my head forever by Bill Belichick and Scott Pioli. Keep everything in perspective. And you have to do that. As a fan base, media, you don't. But, you know, right now, just keep it in perspective that he's making some good moves. He's not necessarily the answer of the answer. And everyone else, you know, have crapped down their legs with their quarterback. It's not fair. There's some good quarterbacks out there that will have time to grow. And in time, it's not eight games. It's three and four years to truly determine what these guys are. That's what I want to keep. Yeah, for about. sure. I think that, no, you're 100% right. And I think you even look back at that 2021 draft, which I talked about, if you would have taken inventory after the first year, you would have said Mac Jones is the most productive of this group, followed by, you know, then it was Lawrence who had just dealt with the, the Urban Meyer year. Zach Wilson was a disaster. Trey Lance barely played. And Jordan Love barely played. Or Jordan Love was the previous draft. But you look and, like, you mix that thing up. Or two years ago, it was, like, Tua was terrible. And Justin Herbert was the best thing since sliced bread. And, you know, they've converged a little bit, not completely. Herbert's, I think, still better. But, you know, like, it, it's to your point. And, and one thing I do think is encouraging about Houston is the size of their injury report going into the, uh, the game in Cincinnati was huge. And I do like, and I know you, you, you felt this way about Matt Ryan, and obviously Brady was this way in spades, but any guy that can overcome perturbations to the roster just makes everybody around them better, including the GM, including the coach, including the receivers. And you look at like a guy like Noah Brown, who one of the most productive players in football could barely get on the field for Dallas for a few years there. And so like, I do think that that's a good, like when, when those quarterbacks, when you can make excuses for them, um, but they, you don't have to because they're being productive despite some injuries. I I really like that. Um, Let's talk a little bit about the the London game or sorry not the London game it's the Frankfurt Germany game the Colts versus the New England Patriots and again I, I talk about Mac Jones because I'm wondering what the hell happened to Mac Jones I I as a rookie talking about really good you know above above expectation play now you're talking about a guy who's getting benched for ineffective play for Bailey Zappi 
I do think that this is another thing where everybody wants to bag on Josh McDaniels for his time, both with Denver, but now most recently with Vegas. Josh McDaniel had that, had Mac Jones playing good football before he left. And I wonder, you know, what is necessary to get Mac Jones back on track? Because I just think that, you know, he's really holding the Patriots back to a certain extent. And it's, it's kind of causing, it's bubbling up a lot of questions about obviously Bill and, 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 you know, they just cut Jack Jones, who's also the CEO of Sumer. Um, but they, they cut one of their picks lat from last year, like a mid round pick. Uh, I think, I think things in new England are, are really, are really dicey right now. And I think it starts with the quarterback play. Man. I mean, you can't get away from this. I don't know about you, the energy dicey, jittery, right? I don't like seeing jittery quarterbacks and there are reasons. Sometimes it's coming off of injuries. Sometimes it's coming off of a bad stretch, you know, like golfers, you know, they get the yips in their own way. He feels yippy beyond. And I did like him coming out. I thought, I thought Josh McDaniel did a really good job with putting him right down the line to accentuate his positives and, and curtail some of his challenges. I watch him now, of course, you know, he and Bill ostensibly aren't getting along. Well, for, I don't know, who knows what it is, but watching Bill O'Brien on the sideline laying into him, I saw him take a deep breath after I saw him, you know, I'm talking about, you know, Mac, yeah. he leaned back and he just took a big sigh after he got benched. I'm just thinking he, he, he's just, he's a mess. I, well, you, you, you remember, you remember the the Vikings team in the late 90s I was a kid and Randall Cunningham came off the bench and like won an MVP basically right and then they lose and the next year Randall was so bad that they had to sit him down for Jeff George and Jeff George took him to the playoffs and all the stuff and it was honestly Dennis Green's like best trait was to be able to win games for the back quarterback but I remember and it'll never it'll ne I'll never forget what Randall Cunningham said when they benched him he said I actually feel a level of relief now. And you wonder about these people, you know, and, and it's the same thing. Like, you know, you think about obviously like all the pressure that you were under as general manager, of the, at the Falcons and all the pressure Dan must've been under as the head coach and Matt. And like, and you think about like, you know, for some of those guys, the pressure is just like getting there. And there's, and you think about with Mac Jones, it's like, does he have the facilities to overcome that pressure or does he need to go back do they need to go back into a place where less is expected of him, like he was when he was a rookie? And but yeah, exactly, um, exactly like when when he sat down, he was just like, and you could see it. He was like he was hyperventilating, and and just getting him out of the game just like probably was like good for his like health in general. But like it does, and and maybe from a team building standpoint, you can kind of expound on this. Like this is something you do want to measure, or you do want to figure out as if is if you play at Alabama, you lose like what, two or three games your whole career. And then you go to a team like New England and you lose that many games in a month. Like how, how, how able are you to adapt to that? It's a, it's a big point. And you're right. Those big programs like that. So let's circle back. If you can dig into your college, college knowledge right now, college knowledge, go figure. <laughs> Caleb Williams, how many, how many wins does he have this year? Uh, I think they're at five or six, but to your point, they've lost some pretty high profile games. And so we don't norm. we love those guys who run it, right? They run it and they're great. But to your point, people that don't know how to lose and recover and jump back up, that's a positive too, right? Again, it sounds odd because you want someone to, to be undefeated. And, and But the people that don't, I mean, the part of that leadership, look, I say to people all the time, it's not the gun. It's not. You know, it's not it's it's let's start with the ability to communicate and lead. Right. Yep. Which is vital. Let's talk about, you know, accuracy and, and all the other stuff, the avoiding of the sack and the presence and the awareness. Of course, all of that great stuff. But if you're not a leader and you don't know how to recover from getting your ass beaten, get back up, make a big time throw, take the beating and not like sulk. Because when I hear people say, I've never lost in my 17 years since high yeah. school, since I'm like, eh, okay. Well, it's only. Well, to your point, like look at uh, Texas tech red Raiders 2014 was Mahomes sophomore year, four and eight, two and seven in conference. And they were seven and six and five and seven in his final two years. Um, 
I don't know if you know this about me, but my freshman year in college, we were 0 and 11. I, uh, you know, there, and we were, by the time we were finished, we were six and five and I think four and seven, my final year, like there's signal, I think in going from to the point of Mahomes is going from a four win team to a seven win team. I think that there's actually in, in a college football realm where you can elevate a team without that many great players. There is some signal to that, to your point. And I, and I do wonder, um, you know, and, and, it was funny because last Saturday, so not this Saturday, but last Saturday, Caleb Williams, there was like a story about him going over to his mother and hugging her and everything in the stands. And people are talking about whether that was, and I'm just like, it's so interesting to think about how much these guys are going through on a week to week basis that, you know, it does, there is like an element of regulation. I always like to say, you know, you know, we're both, you know, obviously you run things at Sumer and, and I, and I, you know, I'm on leadership, but I always think like when I was in high school, I was like a star on the football team. And I was like a bench player on the basketball team and having like both different points of view is like actually really good in life. Right. Being able to understand what it's like to be, to be the top dog and have everybody depend on you and understanding what it's like to be a supporting person. Yeah. It, it there, there's value there. Right. And I think that, or with Caleb Williams, it's like, there's value in having expectations that are high like last year. And then this year where expectations aren't quite as high, but you're trying to overcome them and you're playing teams that are better than you. Like, I, I do think that the shock of the NFL season is going to be less onerous on the Drake Mays, right? They almost lost that game the other day and, and, and the Caleb Williams, because they have to overcome things that are not winning all 12 games every regular season. You asked me earlier and we kind of jumped away from it a little bit, but back to Atlanta and back and 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 uh, obviously back to Arizona and talking about quarterbacks and the ongoing discussion this year about you know okay all right there there's Arthur Smith in another precarious situation right all of a sudden Heineke gets injured you put back Desmond Ritter and you know he's doing what he has to do I mean how complicated is that for Coach Smith to deal with? not getting the first down and falling. I mean, it's a small thing, but everyone's going to pile on with that, right? That could happen yeah. to anyone. Do you kick that? Do you run it? I mean, statistically, do you know what it read? Was it, what did, what did your data aficionados state in that? So you're, you're talking about the Trey McBride catch. No, I'm talking about when Desmond Ritter fell on his first. Oh, down on the fourth and one, one, when he was trying to do a sneak and just like slip down. Well, I know that that stadium, like, again, I, I'm going to say this, I'm going to say this as, as hopefully as, as nurturing as I can. We all saw the Super Bowl that happened in that stadium. People slip all over the place in that stadium. I, I think that they were unprepared for that. And, and their backup quarterback not having the right cleats or whatever is, is a huge, is a huge part of just like, are you doing are you doing the 10 out of 10 thing? You know, Bill Belichick's team would have the right cleats on in a situation like that. So I get, so that, that's something now, as far as what the Falcons should do at quarterback, they should just play Ritter the rest of the year. Right. Cause at this point, like you already know what you're having Heineke putting Heineke in was supposed to win the games against the teams that weren't any good. Like the Vikings without Kirk cousins and the, and the one and eight Arizona Cardinals. And he couldn't deliver that for you. Right. So he's, He's failed at the job that you've acquired him for, Heineke, right? So, so the next best thing is to play Ritter, figure out what you have in him. You likely don't have a ton left in him, but he's he's the guy. But there were there were some glimmers of hope for the Falcons Sunday. They gave the ball to Bijan Robinson. You know, uh, I thought Drake London uh, was was pretty solid. Dan Bodine said uh, it was four point two win probability, so he lost four uh, percent to win that game on that play. Um, I'm also thinking about like when the Arizona tight end caught the ball inside the 10, you got to push him into the end zone so you can get the ball back. Like, what are, yeah. what are you doing? Holding him up, taking seconds off the clock. Like that has to be part of it too. Right. Like, also, I, I mean, and, and to, to Arizona's credit, time is of the essence, right. On the other side, the fact that they got creative and, you know, kept running the time out. I mean, one could argue that, you know, Ritter getting anxious, trying to get in as much as he can, leaving with 233 left on the clock. I've been there before, by the way. This this is not a judgment on Arthur Smith or anyone. 
it's a it's an organizational discussion, right? When when defensive coordinators send the message, and people don't like to hear this, we need we need two and a half minutes or two point twenty minutes to march down the field and get a real legit opportunity. If if we if we if we score right away, or if we fiddle around a little bit, not fiddle around, but if we manage our time, run, run, do this, do that, keep it going, and try to try to chip off the clock. That's what you have to do. And sometimes I saw it. Sometimes you let a guy in, so you get the damn ball back in your hands, so you have two thirty-three, and you don't. I mean, I'm not saying they let Ritter in, but I'm saying they were creative with it. And they're like, let's get the ball in our hands and see what we can do. And I think that's important. I think it's, yeah. a, it's a really important thought to, to decide. Well, and, I, and I think that that's what you do when you have, when you put processes in place to have the rest of the thing figured out. Like, let, let's let's talk briefly about the lines because I want to actually, and I sent you and, and Scott a message about this because I think it dovetails to the Falcons thing, right? So let, let's connect this up. Yeah. The Lions, with a little over two minutes, or I think a little under two minutes left in the in the game, were a tie game in a game that they had led by fourteen, a game where they had done a lot of fourth down conversions, a lot of just really aggressive, a, real, a lot of confident football. Right? They get in, and they've gotten caught from behind. Justin Herbert played a phenomenal game, like threw over four hundred yards, all these touchdowns. But most importantly. He took his team from down 14 to tied. Yep. Lions get the ball back. They drive the length of the field. They, they're stuck with a fourth and two. Not a fourth and inches. Not a fourth and one. Fourth and two. And they're like, okay, we could give the ball. We could kick a field goal, longer field goal. Whether or not it goes in, who knows. We could kick a field goal and go up three and give the ball back to one of the best quarterbacks in football and pray, you know, hope and pray that we get, you know, get a stop. Or... I'm going to put this game in the hands of my $30 million quarterback and my second round pick tight end and my offensive line Herbert or by the way, Jared Goff did not get hit once yesterday. The stats did not get hit once by, by Los Angeles defense. Take a step back, complete the ball, run the clock down, kick a game winning field goal, get out of Los Angeles with the win seven and two, one game out of the one seed in the NFC. Right. And I think about that. Right. And I think about, all the things you need as an NFL team to get to that point, if you're Dan Campbell, if you're Brad Holmes, if you're the people that built this team, you have assistant coaches that you respect and you trust. Ben Johnson's calling that offensive play. You know, Aaron Glenn's calling the defense. The special teams are phenomenal, all this stuff. You have motivation, right? Your coach is clearly one of the best motivators in all of football. You have that down. You have... You, you kind of, you have every a letter of the alphabet span. And so when you get to a fork in the road where almost every other coach would make the uh, the other decision, you you have the time and the faculties to think it through and convert it and end a team like that. What we just talked about, Thomas, was in, in the rare case that a tight end gets deep on you inside the five-yard line, you push him into the end zone, you overcome your instincts to tackle him, like those things aren't thought about when teams are kind of on the edge of competence. And I, and I mean this again, I don't mean this in a dicky way, but when a team is on the edge of competence, when they're just trying to fight it out to get confidence and get wins and all this stuff, they're not thinking about those third and fourth order things. They're just doing right. And we come up for air and we're like, what were they thinking? It's like, they weren't thinking, right. They have to think about the scheme and all this other stuff. They have to worry about whether they're going to trot Desmond Ritter or T Taylor Heineke out of quarterback. They're not, they don't have the time. The, the, the lions, which, and we know Jared Goff's kind of a midliner. We know all this stuff, but whatever the lions are, they are, and they're full speed ahead. And so that their coach can actually look at the boundaries of the game and call a special play for that particular time. That that's, and the Patriots, have been that way forever. Everybody wonders about, oh, why are they lining up Shane Vereen at right tackle against the Ravens in the playoffs? It's like, because they got everything. They've aced the rest of football. Now they can think about the extra credit stuff, right? Yeah. In a weird way, the Lions have aced football right now, taking a team from the, like, 3-13 and 13 to, you know, the two seed in the NFC right now. And so that they can, you know, 
they can win winning breeds winning type of plays on teams like the Chargers. And I and I watch that and I'm just thinking I'm like very happy for that franchise because they they've gone from, you know, as far as as far as you know, the coach has has really emerged from a person that people really weren't buying into to somebody who can, you know, make a call like that in the other games. So my head is going to, it's not the same. We didn't come from as far back, but Dan Quinn, when he came to the Atlanta Falcons, it took him three years to get to the Super Bowl. Are you saying that Dan Campbell is in the same line as Dan Quinn, as far as pure quality of coach? And do you think he has a chance to get to the Super Bowl in year three? I, it's different. Dan Campbell is not going to – if Dan Campbell loses his job as the head coach of the Lions, he's not going to go somewhere and be an A-plus coordinator the same way that Dan Quinn did. Good point. I, I think that Campbell is much more is much more in that Mike Tomlin realm where I think that the leadership qualities are all there. I think Dan Quinn's a brilliant defensive mind who was also a good head coach. And so I think it's different. I do think the Lions can win the can make the Super Bowl because there we have them as a 12.6% chance to get the one seed and a bye. You know, there's a really good chance they face the team that wins the NFC South if they get the bye, which that team's not gonna be very good as we talked about. And so you really have one game against maybe the Eagles, Cowboys, or 49ers to win to go to the Super Bowl. And that, in a game like that, anything can happen. Now, I think. I think Dan Quinn, like it's so to your point, like what happens to the Lions when Ben Johnson gets a head coaching job? What happens when Aaron Glenn gets a head coaching job? What happens when he's got to find another really good coordinator? That's an open question, right? And I think that that was that's part of the the difficulty. But I think currently, right now, as far as like a CEO type head coach, I think Dan Campbell's quite good. I would not trade a first round pick for him, but I think I think he's growing into that role incredibly well. Since I've been on the hot seat many, many years, I'm going to put you on a different hot seat. Uh -oh. Can Jared Goff, when the shit hits the fan <clears throat> and they get to the Super Bowl, hypothetically, can he handle that? Wouldn't that be a great story? That many years later after the Rams trade, the Rams get their Super Bowl and he comes back. Can he do that? Does he have the makeup to do that? I think he does. I mean, they were down 13-0 in New Orleans in the conference title game. And now I know he shit himself in the Super Bowl against Bill. But, like, the game before, right, against a very good Saints team, now there was some help with the officials not calling the pass interference and all that stuff. But he was phenomenal in that game. Like, and and they got behind. He he was nails. He, he, he really did the thing that game. I – so yes, he can. Am I gonna if he's in a Super Bowl with Patrick Mahomes? Am I gonna would I bet a cent on Jared Goff? No, no way. There's not probably not a price you could give me that I bet on Goff. But is it possible? Yeah, I especially now wait, where wait, 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 my friend. As smart as you are, I want some backing on this. I'm putting you in a okay. spot. This so is a chance. there's this much, much, but can he do it when the crap hits the fan and it is tough and it is dusty? And there's all kinds of pressures, and he starts getting some badass pressure from some of these big time teams. We haven't even dug into the teams they played when he's thrived yeah. and not. I would love to see that. I'm only curious because I want to know from an analytic standpoint. I think I think if you can. So yesterday, Jared Goff was not hit. Jared Goff splits pressured and non-pressured are as wide as any quarterback in the NFL. Also golf struggles with, I call them even coverages, which is like quarters and six and stuff like that. He's much better against man. He's much better against cover three. Um, so if he catches a team like that, like the Patriots who ran almost no cover four and then ran all cover four in that Super Bowl, and you have somebody who's brilliant, like he's going to get taken down hundred percent. Um, I, we are looking at the league page right now. The Lions, by the way, have the fifth highest Super Bowl odds uh, behind only the Ravens, Niners, Eagles, and Chiefs. Uh, a lot of that is structural. Um, the, Dallas is just below them because Dallas probably won't win their own division. Um, but but I I would say yes, he can. I but but here's the deal: you have to be in a position where you can protect him. And yesterday, 
that defensive line for the Chargers has a Bosa and has and has Khalil Mack, and they did not touch him. If he isn't touched, I think he can be competent. Like because his issues are not clean pocket misses. There, he's under pressure and he starts throwing picks, right? And so if he's playing, so if he played Buffalo, Buffalo, other than Von Miller, doesn't have a great pass rush. If they play um, the Dolphins, I think the Dolphins with Wilkins and Chubb and Jalen uh, Phillips can pressure him. But, like, it, it's really going to be matchup dependent. If they play the Chiefs, I don't know. I mean, Chris Jones being back and, like, you know, Karloftis is one of the league leaders in pressures and all that stuff. It's going to be tough. Can he? Yes. I think that the big issue is going to be can he face a team? Can can he luck into facing a team that won't put as much pressure on him? Because I think if he does, like they're very very good on offense and they support him really well. And he drives the car. He's not the he's not a you know he's he would be he would be a, an outlier in terms of Super Bowl winners as a as a guy who is being supported as opposed to being the the main guy on a team for sure. I think that that's hundred percent true. So I've made this comment before that I think Brett Veach is in a fantastic spot, and I think he's a top-notch GM, albeit still fairly young, even though he'll argue with me he's not as young as I, if I, as I give him credit. But I've always said the GM, when you have the trifecta, right, top-notch owner, one of the very best in Kansas City, head coach and quarterback, when you're looking at Detroit, and we're talking about the GM again, Brad Holmes, right, he's doing a heck of a job as it's gone, he's three years, right? He's got a head coach who's considered upper echelon top, not, I'm not saying top 10 I'm just, or eight or five, or I'm not even, I'm just saying upper echelon, right? Leads very well, knows how to surround himself. Ownership, longtime owner, you know, I'm saying ownership family. Mm-hmm. Okay. But then the last and most quite honestly, important piece is Jared Goff, a top tier quarterback he's not is he a top 10 just answer one yes or no no is he a top 13 yes oh okay so you're so wow. like okay but the, okay, the, it's, it's so so here good questions i think the problem is is like is he a top 10 quarterback three years ago no Nowadays, though, Cousins hurt, um, Tom Brady retired, Big Ben retired, Philip Rivers retired, uh, Drew Brees retired. There's not that many good quarterbacks in the NFL. Like, I, it, it's, it's a weird situation. So to, to back your point up about the Chiefs, that means if you have a team with a real good quarterback, you got the league by the balls, right? That's, that's where Brett Beach and Kansas City are. But, like – who let, let's actually look at this again. Let's, let's, let's bring this up. I, I bring up this, this, this thing because I, I really want to like, cause I'm also like tethering this to the the conference. So let's look at the different conferences. Is Jared yeah, Goff. Better? Where, where are my quarterbacks up on this? Okay. Just let's do, I was just going to go by teams and who their quarterback is, but let's just go with quarterback. Okay. So we go by total EPA. Allen's in the AFC. Mahomes in the AFC. Stroud's in the AFC. Tua, Herbert are all in the AFC. Lamar Jackson's in the AFC. Let's look at the other guys. Like, is Purdy? Purdy is like in a Holy very good smokes. situation. Wait, wait, Jared Goff with sixty-eight two, right? Is that his percentage? 68? Yeah. Gosh. No, he's right here. Yep. I thought I saw Stafford's fifty-nine. I'm like, whoa. And that was one below. Well, that is what Stafford. Stafford has been a wild child this year, although it's been kind of fun, but he has thrown a decent amount of picks and it's not been that efficient. Yeah. Okay. Um, but like when I look at this, like quarterbacks who are currently healthy and in the NFC, who would you take over a golf Prescott and hurts? Certainly. Yeah. Um, after <laughs> that, it gets kind of dicey, right? Gino it Smith gets dicey. It gets dicey. You know what I'm saying? So, like, I agree, like, you know, five years ago when you were going against Tom Brady, Aaron Rodgers, like in the NFC alone, Tom Brady, Aaron Rodgers, Drew Brees, um, Russell Wilson in Seattle, like, I I would give him much less of a chance. But in this current NFC, like, 
Dak Prescott has a four interception game in him in the playoffs. What if that happens in Detroit? You know, like I, that that's kind of what I, that's like my whole thesis is like to win in the NFC doesn't actually take great quarterback play. Great rebut way to work through your intelligentsia. Uh, and I appreciate it. I, I agree with you though. And I do, I do think that I do think I, I get nervous, especially with him playing outdoors. Now, they have the Detroit Lions, and again, this is part of it. Detroit has one more outdoor game all year. Yeah. And Goff yeah. has always been a bad cold weather guy, but he's they have a road game in Dallas, a road game in New Orleans, a road game in Minnesota, and then they have all home games except for a road game in Chicago, who, you know, is an inferior team to them. Like I think that, you know, obviously anything could happen, but they they could go. They they could get a good seed and then never have to play in a cold weather game in the playoffs until the, and then the Super Bowl is in a dome. So before we go, because I know we're getting close, you presented a, a, a thought to me, and I didn't know if we're going to get there, but I I want to circle back around. Do not mean to be jumping around like this, but you said. Is Bill Belichick losing his steam? I think that's how you worded it. Is that correct? Uh I mean, I don't think I said that on air, but I'm more but I, I'm but certain like I, I yeah, I yes, it is is Bill Belichick are we seeing the last year of Philadelphia Andy Reid? Is a good is maybe the, the question I'll say. No, I want to answer the question first of all. I do not in any way think we're seeing Bill Belichick run out of steam in football in general. I really don't. I think maybe that's a long, that's 22 or 23 years in one place, right? Yep. That is, that's a, you know, you heard Bill Polian saying after 10 years, any GM or head coach should be fired. I disagreed with it when I was in my 12th year because I'm like, no, I think we can prolong this to 15. 22 years with the same ownership group, of course, with massive you know egos in the in the sense of it all right it's it's yeah. very complicated so well, i think new place new location renewed let's let's hone in on we i've said it before no i think he can go toe to toe with anyone and i think if there's one coach out there that comes available bill belichick is the person who's going to get teams out in the nfl who need a coach and want to win a Super Bowl, he's the guy that gets him there in three years over anyone else available right now. Now, you tell me who the other guys that would vie for that. Who are available, I don't think. I mean, well, I, no, I threw this out here because I interact with a decent amount of the, you know, through my writing and, and obviously this podcast, we have a ton of, of loyal listeners. By the way, we're setting a record today for the number of people watching live Thomas. So that's really yeah. good. Um, oh, good. Yep. I think Sean McDermott with, when you factor in age and you factor in effectiveness is the only one that comes close. And I don't even think he comes that close as far as guys are available, but to my point earlier, and, and again, this hopefully gives you comfort because you you've watched your former team, the Falcons the last three years, kind of every single Sunday kind of revealed that like there was more going on there than just Thomas Dimitrov, you know, the, like, you know what I'm saying? Like sometimes to your point about, you know, there just needs to be change for change's sake. And I think that in the case, for example, with Andy Reed, Andy Reed, that last year with the Eagles was really bad four and 12, like a 10 game losing streak, all this stuff. He goes mm -hmm. to Kansas city and they win nine. That was a two win team that won nine straight games coming out of the jump have, have never had a losing season. I agree with you. I, I, but I, the, the one part I have an issue with, with the whole Belichick thing is we, we do have to acknowledge that it's going poorly in new England. Like that's yeah. the one thing I don't think people really want to like the bridge. No one wants to cross, which is to say acknowledge freely. It's not going well there. And, and maybe a change is good for bill is kind of maybe the point. And to your, and to the previous analogy I tried to make is Andy, when he got let go by the Eagles was hired by the chiefs in like a day or two and just kept like reach changed himself a little bit, moved on. The same thing probably would be true about Belichick. The one question I have before we go, and I know we got to get going. Um, 
what GM would be willing to trade his or her assets to acquire a coach who I think we're all we're all in agreement here would have significant power, maybe not over that GM, but in in concert with it would be an awkward situation, right? Like if you're if you're a GM and you're making this trade, you're either a lame duck guy or you you have to humble yourself significantly, which wouldn't be that wouldn't be as bad because it's Belichick and how amazing he is. But it is a good question, right? Like, who, what GM would would step in front of that bus? Okay, I have a strong I have a strong feeling about it. A GM who's in his third or fourth year, who's gaining some ground and has some growing cachet, no way. A GM that can pull his owner aside and say, Mister Owner. I literally think that I'm going to put my own ego aside. I'm going to put my own comfort level aside, meaning comfort level in the sense of like being able to run the show, walk around, you know, I got to be careful what I say here, but walk around slinging it around. Like you're the dude, you can put it aside. And I'm going to tell the owner, if, if, if you, if this is going to help me parlay this into two and three more contracts, this is my this is my feeling, right? This is what we need to do for the team, for the yep. betterment of the team, is to bring someone in like Bill, and it has to be the right fit. I get it. I mean, some people couldn't do it. The GM that's out there that knows they're on they're on enough of a hot seat. If if the owner is going to say you're going to stay around, you're going to be the number two in the organization, and you're going to do all your part to help Bill Belichick grow this team help where you need to help on the personnel side, because more than likely that GM is going to have to have legitimate personnel ability for Bill. If hypothetically for someone like Bill to come in there and say, this is who I want in here with me, right? I want a personnel man who knows it through and through who can give me good guidance and leadership on building a football team. Right. But again, it has, you have to have someone that has a lot of confidence at this point in their career. Well, and I think this gets back to the whole example of Randall Cunningham, which is like for some people, it might be a relief. It might be a relief where you've cut your teeth evaluating, you've cut your teeth in the case of like Quasi building models and all this stuff. And now that you're in that chair, it's a ton of things to think about. And if you bring somebody in who ha- can supplement you in that way, it's probably a, a relief in some ways. And so I do think that there are probably more people, men or women, that would be willing to do that than I would have guessed uh, a priori. So um, that's a good answer. And can I just say, too, all of that said and all of my ramble there, because I think there are nuances to that GM who's going to be the incumbent. And they're like, all right, I'm going to pull aside. I'm going to let Bill Belichick, who is the best in the history of this league, modern time. There's only two others, as we know, out there, right? Paul Brown and Vince Lombardi, at least that's yep. arguable. That's what a lot of people are saying. There are very, Bill Belichick is going as the dude wherever he goes. There's no mistake about that. And if there's not a comfort level in that person, who that person is, and, and quite honestly, they don't have ties to the Patriot paradigm, that's a complicated thing, right? Bill doesn't have time in my mind. I'm not speaking for him, but – to come in there or nor does an owner to fiddle around for two years to see if something is going to work. That owner is bringing him in to help him win a Super Bowl now. Mm-hmm. And if that means Mr. GM, who's already in there and it means moving on, then so be it. Why are you smirking? You're, 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 you're well, smirking. The, the reason I'm smirking is because two really good te- candidate teams for that. Three candidate teams for that are actually in their division. Like, if he went to Buffalo, right, let's just say, a team that's been on the doorstep for three, four years, Brandon Bean's one of the best at what he does, Sean McDermott's one of the best at what he does, but much like Tony Dungy was one of the best at what he did, and it took John Gruden to win a Super Bowl in Tampa Bay, sometimes that re- is required, right? I, it's I'm thinking through teams in my head for which this applies, right? He's not going to go to Atlanta. He's not going to go, like, and I'm I'm just speculating. He's not going to go somewhere that needs a little bit of a rebuild. He wants to go somewhere that's going to win a Super Bowl quickly. 
and has the goods because that's obviously what, you know, at this point in his career, that's what he has time for. The Jets are a team that you watch that team and you think you think he would be sat like, do you think he would deal with the quarterback situation that they have currently? Like it's just it was it was funny to me to think about the teams that kind of fit that profile and realize that like they're like the Patriots wouldn't trade him to any of those teams. And and it makes me kind of laugh. Well, don't be don't be surprised. I mean, look, I've said this before, you know, and I will definitely say it again. As the season moves on, even though a lot of these owners, as you know, early in the tenure of certain coaches, and I won't pinpoint this, but you all can put your minds on it, all you football followers in the NFL. There are head coaches out there that have just lauded their coaches early on and lot of them during some of the losses and ups and downs. All of a sudden, that owner is faced with an opportunity to get one of the very best ever. It's not, it doesn't matter to that owner if he goes against what he's saying. Like, I didn't think Bill Belichick was going to be available, hypothetically speaking, right? I'm sorry. I know I told you 100%. I love you. And we're going to be together and make a nice run on this. All of a sudden, it's like, wow, this is an opportunity. Doesn't mean because they switch, they're not, they're dishonest or they're a horse's ass because they go against what they've been talking about. It's like, I have to do what's best for this organization. Who gets an opportunity to have one of the very best? And and yeah, it doesn't come up. It doesn't come up very often. And and that's why, you know, Romeo Cornell was a one year coach for the Chiefs because Andy Reid was available. Like all this right. kind of stuff happens. Uh, it, yeah. And 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 to rebut my own point, the Jets did trade like draft picks to the Patriots for not only Bill Parcells, but also Curtis Martin. And, and that, you know, that did happen before and uh, both teams lived to talk about it. So um, by the way, Bill Belichick, twice the head coach of the Jets, never coached a game for them is still like the best stat of all time. Um, and I know that you guys have, you know, you and Scott have all the, like kind of those connections there. Although you were never a part of the Jets, right? Like it was always, you were kind of, Doing your, you were kind of that, those, that was the late '90s when you were messing around with, it, you know, being a Detroit Lion, right? No, look, the only reason that I ended up with Bill and Scott was because of Scott's push early on, and then, of course, as you're around Bill in that situation, you you grow, and you know, he's a loyalty guy, and he wants people that are going to put their their asses on the line as a player, management, or coaches. So, I think they realize over time, they Scott and Bill as a partnership, um, that that they wanted people that. We're of like mind at certain levels. We don't, we don't even we don't have time to get into it. Why have certain guys been health or um, strategically um, successful coming out of that group, and why not? It's it's obviously for another discussion. So. Yeah, and that and we'll have plenty of time because we're only if we're a few months away from that. But this is a great. I thought this was a great podcast. We do cover the league like no one else does. We appreciate all of you. The increasingly big. Uh, audience that we're getting live on especially Mondays thank you continue to tell people three o'clock every Monday uh ish uh if Thomas and I don't have a million things to talk about beforehand um and and make sure that you hit the like button hit the subscribe button send a review in uh somebody on uh the the review said I say right too much which is a new one I normally say like too much so I am going to try to be a little bit better there with my uh what I'll call throwaway words uh, you know, we all, we all have a few of those. So um, for Thomas Dimitrov, for Eric Eager, this has been the Sumer Sports Show.